Hello, my name is Katie Hubble. I'm the registered nurse here at Good Shepherd's Cardiac Rehab. In today's class, we're going to talk about cardiac medications. Okay. So cardiac medications, I will warn you, there are quite a few medications, so I'm going to try to simplify this as best I can for you, okay? Um, why are cardiac medications so important? They're important because we want to reduce your risk for any future heart events. We want to slow the progression. If you have coronary artery disease, we want to slow that down. Um, we want to prevent any kind of blood clots that could cause a stroke or a heart attack. We want to manage high blood pressure, manage high cholesterol. We want to manage or stop any symptoms that you might be experiencing. We want to improve your quality of life and keep you out of the hospital, help you live longer. You guys feel like this little cartoon here? We combined all your medications into one convenient dose. Some of us probably think we wouldn't be able to swallow it if that was true. <laughs> Medication adherence just means taking the proper medication and dose at the right time in the right way for as long as your doctor has prescribed it. Now, heart patients with poor medication adherence, meaning they are not taking their meds routinely like they've been prescribed, have up to four times greater risk of stroke and death. Four times greater just because you're not taking your medications routinely like you're supposed to, that your doctor has prescribed for you. Also, you're gonna have increased ER visits and or hospital admissions. So you always wanna take your medications as your doctor has prescribed them routinely. At the same time, the right dose, the right medication, for as long as your doctor has prescribed it. Never stop taking a medication and never change your dosage or the frequency without first consulting your doctor. This is very important. There are some cardiac meds that are very dangerous to stop suddenly. So you always want to consult with your doctor before changing, making any changes. Now it's always good to understand and know your medications. If you know what they're for, you know, what medications you're taking, you're going to be more likely to keep taking them routinely. So you need to know what medications you're taking, know why you're taking it, know your dosage, and follow your doctor's directions. Always keep a list of your current medications with you at all times. If there's ever an emergency and you end up in the ER, hopefully you're conscious, but what if you're not conscious? You know, you want to be able to provide this list or a family member be able to pull this list out to give to them. There's a lot of medications that can contradict each other and are, can be unsafe. So you want to be able to convey to the um, staff what medications you are taking, all right? And then sometimes it's hard to remember them all and remember all the dosage. So write it down. Keep a card with you at all times and keep it updated. Make sure that when you have a medication change that you change that on your medication card as well. Tips. Lots of good tips for you guys. Be involved in your treatment plan, okay? If your doctor's prescribing you a medication, ask him why. Ask him what it's for. Be proactive in your plan. Be a part of your plan and your treatment. Don't let them just take over. This is your body, and you have a right to know what's going on and why. So be proactive. Be involved. Refill your medications before you run out. I cannot tell you how important this is. A lot of people do not pay attention and they run out and then they go without this medication for a day or so and it can be dangerous. So you always want to get it refilled before. A lot of patients have ended up back in the ER 
because they ran out of medication and didn't get it refilled. And they could have avoided that by just staying on top of it. Tell your physician about any concerns or side effects that you may be having from the medication. All right? If you start having some severe side effects that are not tolerable and you're having a difficult time, don't just stop the medicine. Talk to your doctor about it. Okay, it might be a side effect that eventually um, will, you know, settle down after a few days, or it could be something that they could try a different medication that wouldn't bother you nearly as much, but still have the same effect and do the same thing. So it's always important to communicate with your doctor on these issues. Don't just stop taking it. Tell your do doctor or pharmacist if you're having financial difficulties paying for your meds. Some of these medications are outrageous, and we understand that. There are so many programs out there that can help you with payment for medications. A lot of your doctors and your pharmacists know what these programs are and can assist you. Make sure all your physicians know all the medications you are prescribed. I guarantee you just because your cardiologist put you on a medication doesn't mean that your primary doctor knows what you're on and that they put you on that, okay? That's why you have a list with you, right? You're taking that list to your doctor's appointments. It's an updated list and you're keeping all your doctors updated. The communication between your doctors is lacking. You want to make sure they know. And you want to make sure they know about all the over-counter medications that you're taking as well, not just the prescribed medications. Store your medications properly in a secure, cool, dry place out of sunlight or as directed. Okay, that's why they come in these yellow tan bottles or orange, is because it's trying to protect the medication from sunlight, doesn't want to um, decrease the effect of the medication. So we're trying to keep it out of sunlight. You want it to be in a cool, dry place. A lot of people like to keep their meds in the bathroom. If you have a small bathroom and you're getting a lot of steam with showers, it gets pretty humid in there. That's not a good place to store your medications in. Okay, it needs to be a cool, dry place. And keep them secure from younger children um, that can get into them if that's, you know, if you have children in your house. Don't crush your break tablets or capsules unless the doctor or the pharmacist tells you it's okay. Now, if you're wondering, you're not sure, talk to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist. Some of them you can break if they're too large for you to swallow. Sometimes it's okay to actually crush or break that tablet, but not always. If you have an extended release medication, that is meant to last throughout the entire day, that's something you do not want to crush because you're going to get a large dose all at once if you crush that, and then it's not going to last throughout the whole day. So you always want to check with them first. Never stop taking your medication because you are feeling better. I've heard this from patients a lot. Don't stop taking it unless your doctor tells you to. Please, you're feeling better because your medication is actually working. That's why. So as soon as you stop it, you're going to go right back to how you were. That medication is helping you feel better. That's why you're taking it, and that's why you need that medication. Okay? Don't remember medications by color. I have many patients that tell me, oh, it's this, you know, blue pill or yellow pill, that tells us nothing, okay? You can have the same medication in several different colorations and different um, sizes and forms and shapes. It all depends on the manufacturer. So by you remembering a medication by color is not going to help staff or medical staff know what that medication is. Call your doctor or pharmacist if you forget to take your medicine or accidentally took more than recommended, okay? Sometimes we forget. We're human. That's okay. But you want to make sure, kind of the rule of thumb that I have, 
for medications is if you take it every 12 hours and you're closer to the next dose than you were to your um, dose that you missed, then you're going to wait and take it the next dose. But if you're closer to the time you missed than you are to the next dose, then take it. But if you're not sure, always check with your doctor or your pharmacist and they can help you. Lots of ways are um, available to help you remember to take your medications. Using a pill box is wonderful. You don't have to sit there every day opening up a bunch of bottles. You can do it once a week and set all your medications out. They have pill boxes that accommodate all different, you know, times and days, whatever your needs are. So those have been very beneficial. As far as remembering to take your meds, take advantage of technology. You know, if you have a smartphone, set a reminder on there or set an alarm clock or a timer, something um, that will remind you and alert you, it's time to take your medications. Combine it with a task, like if you have breakfast every day, take your medications with breakfast. So that's just part of that routine that you will remember to do that each and every morning. Enlist a loved one. You know, if your spouse is on a medication and is taking it at the same time, then help each other. Help remind each other. Keep it visible. That's another thing, out of sight, out of mind, right? If you keep it out and you keep it visible, you're more likely to remember to take it. Um, break out of the autopilot. Sometimes we think, oh my gosh, did we take it? I can't even remember. Um, I've had a, a couple ideas people have told me, uh, turning bottles upside down, after they take them so they know that day that they did take them. There's lots of the tricks out there that can help you. But if you have a pill box and you're not sure if you took them or not, when you go back and check the pill box, you're gonna know for sure. Whereas if they're in the actual pill bottle that they came in from pharmacy, you're not gonna know if you took it or not. All right, we're going to touch base on types of cardiac medications, and there are many. I'm going to make this as pain-free as possible. First, we're going to talk about anticoagulants. They're also known as blood thinners. Anticoagulants are to help prevent blood clots. We want to reduce the risk of stroke and heart attacks. Okay, blood clots are what cause the strokes and what cause heart attacks. So we're going to thin your blood with anticoagulants to prevent that from happening. Now you'll see here on the left side of your screen a list of common anticoagulants are in bold, cumin and morphine. It's you know, two different names, it's the same med. So you'll see very, the different names, it's the same medication. Um, but the ones that are most common or well known will be bold. Um, the others, there's many others out there that are being used, and they're also listed, but I can't list everything, so just be aware of that. Um, anticoagulants are going to increase the risk of bruising and bleeding, so you're going to notice you bruise much easier when you're on anticoagulants. In fact, you're going to have to be very careful shaving or if you cut yourself because it's going to be difficult to stop the bleeding because you're not going to clot as quickly. So you need to really take care not to injure yourself and if you do please apply pressure if you cut yourself. Keep that pressure on there until the bleeding stops and if it's not stopping then you need to go to the ER to get assistance. Warfin um, will require ongoing blood to be tested routinely. At first, you might have to get it tested frequently, and then once they get a dosage for you, then maybe they'll only check it once in a while. It just depends on what your doctor recommends. So anticoagulants, we're trying to thin your blood, but we don't want to get it too thin because you can bleed internally. And we don't want to get it too thick because you can get a blood clot. So we got to find that therapeutic range, and we can only do that by checking the blood. So sometimes the dosage will change with this medication, not always. 
some people can be pretty stable once they figure that balance out. You do need to be consistent with your diet and foods that are rich in vitamin K because that will affect the clotting factor of your blood. So it's not that you can't eat any foods that have vitamin K in them. You can. It's just that you need to be consistent about it. Okay? You can't just go and all of a sudden start eating a bunch of food vitamin K. That's going to throw your blood work off. But if you had been eating that food all along, when they found your therapeutic blood range, then you're safe. Then it's okay. Just continue with a consistent diet. Also be aware you want to avoid any surgeries or invasive dental work unless that medication is placed on hold because you can bleed and they might have difficulty stopping the bleeding. So please, before you have any surgery, before you have any dental work done, you need to make sure the dentist and the doctor are aware that you are on anticoagulants because they will need to be held before that procedure. All right, antiplatelets, they prevent blood clots from forming as well, just like an anticoagulant, but they're just doing it in a different way. They're preventing blood platelets from sticking together to reduce the risk of strokes and heart attacks so that you're not getting blood clots. Aspirin, um, Plavix are the most common ones that we see. If you are a heart patient, you're often prescribed Plavix um, at least six months up to a year after having a heart event, if you've had stents placed or open heart surgery. And they usually will always put you on aspirin, um, and it's prescribed for the rest of your heart patient's lives, okay? Aspirin is something that they will have you take continually for the rest of your life if you are a heart patient. Now, when you are on these medications, you want to avoid ibuprofen and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, okay? These can actually intensify the medication, so you need to be careful because that can cause you to get out of a therapeutic range with these meds. Um, and of course, bruising and bleeding is another concern, so you still need to be cautious, especially if you're on both the anticoagulant antiplatelet, then you're more higher risk. So please be cautious of that. All right, ACE inhibitors stand for angiotensin converting enzymes, and that's just how the medication works. What it is doing is relaxing and expanding your blood vessels, all right? When your blood vessels relax and they open up, it's going to make it easier for the heart to pump blood by decreasing the resistance from those walls, from your blood vessels. That's going to allow blood to flow more easily. And when the blood's flowing more easily, your heart works more efficiently. Okay? So, this type of medication is going to be used to treat various heart um, conditions, such as congestive heart failure or hypertension, which is just high blood pressure. So, of course, one of the things you need to be worried about is if your blood pressure gets too low. You will experience lightheadedness if your blood pressure gets too low. It is common with these medications to have some lightheadedness when you uh, stand up quickly or when you bend over. That's okay, you just need to be cautious of that. Be aware, stand up slowly, just kind of wait a minute before you start to walk. You know, if you're bending over, just stand up slowly, don't move quickly. This postural change really quick can cause that lightheadedness, so um, just be aware of that. Now, if you're lightheaded and dizzy a lot, very often, all the time, and it's interfering with your life, then that's an issue that you need to talk to your doctor because your blood pressure is probably low. Now, that can be a symptom of many things, but it's also a symptom of low blood pressure. ACE inhibitors also can cause a dry, non-productive cough, and some people are not able to tolerate these meds because of that cough. That cough can just get really severe. It becomes such an annoying cough that it's constant and it's really irritating and it's 
interfering with your life, that is something you need to let the doctor know. Okay, just discuss this with your doctor. Also be careful about taking potassium supplements um, while you're on this or using salt substitutes because those usually contain potassium. So be cautious of that because that can interfere with the medication. Some of these you're going to realize that ACE inhibitors, if you look at the names, end in P-R-I-L. So almost every ACE inhibitor you're going to see ends in Pril. Some of these medications you might recognize that you're on, that's an ACE inhibitor. That's there to help lower your blood pressure or to treat your congestive heart failure. Now, the next medication is very similar, okay? Angiotensin II receptor blockers do the exact same thing. They relax and expand the blood vessels, making it easier for the heart to pump blood by decreasing the resistance, which allows the blood to move more freely and the heart work more efficiently, all right? Same thing as an ACE inhibitor, it's also used to treat congestive heart failure and hypertension. But you'll see these angiotensin II receptor blockers are used for those who can't tolerate the ACE inhibitors. If they have developed that cough, uh, that dry, non-productive cough, then the doctors a lot of times will try an angiotensin II receptor blocker, and that might work for that patient. They're also you need to be cautious of low blood pressure because it's there to lower your blood pressure and you don't want to get it too low. Um, cardiac doctors that I speak with, they all say no blood pressure is too low if you're a heart patient unless you have symptoms, okay? Some people can tolerate lower blood pressures than others, but it's not low unless you're having symptoms that are really interfering. Now, they also can draw, uh, cause a dry, non-productive cough. And you also want to talk to your doctor before using potassium supplements or salt substitutes, okay? So these two work hand in hand. Okay, calcium channel blockers. So calcium entering your cells stimulates the heart to contract, to actually these and contract and pump the blood to your body. So by blocking the calcium, it's causing the blood vessels to relax and expand. And it also is slowing the heart rate down. Now that allows blood to flow more easily. So these medications you're gonna see, the calcium channel blockers would be used for hypertension. They can also be used for people with angina with chest pain, or people that have arrhythmias, irregular heart rhythms, okay? So these can be used for a couple of different reasons. Um, you do need to watch for low blood pressure, lightheadedness, but the calcium channel blockers, and one of the main side effects you're gonna see is swelling in your feet and legs. So if this happens, let your doctor know. Beta blockers. A lot of you guys will be on beta blockers. Beta blocker is there to decrease the workload on the heart. Okay, we're trying to help your heart work its optimal functioning that it can through medication. So a beta blocker is going to try to decrease that workload by blocking the effects of adrenaline. This is going to slow your heart rate so your heart does not have to work as hard. And when it's not working as hard, it needs less blood and oxygen to function, right? So, they can use beta blockers to manage arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats, to prevent future heart attacks, to slow the progression of congestive heart failure, to improve heart function, to treat hypertension, as well as angina. Very many uses for beta blockers. You will notice on the list of uh, beta blockers on the left, they all end in LOL. Okay, so if you're on a medication that ends in LOL, 
that is a beta blocker. Some of the things you need to be cautious of are low blood pressure, low heart rate. Your heart rate might not increase nearly as much with exercise as it would if you were not taking a beta blocker. It just means your medication is working. It's doing what it should. It's decreasing the workload of the heart. Okay, so don't become concerned if your heart rate is not going high when you exercise. It's just because they have you on a beta blocker and it's doing its job. Now, sometimes you can have severe fatigue or drowsiness if you're on too high of a dose of beta blockers. I have had patients that have been prescribed beta blockers and they're just very fatigued and those medications need adjusted. And sometimes by just changing that dose to a smaller dose, that will cause or help resolve that problem. But you need to work with your doctor on that. You cannot do that on your own. Okay, beta blockers are one of the medications you never want to stop suddenly because they can cause uh, chest pain if you do that and you need to be very cautious. Now, it might affect your blood sugar. If you're diabetic, you might not notice if your blood sugars are getting low, as you might not have as many symptoms as you did before. Kind of mask those symptoms, so be cautious of that. And don't stop taking it suddenly. I've already talked about this, because it can cause angina, it can cause a heart attack, or it can cause arrhythmia. So it's a very dangerous med to stop suddenly. This is something you want to work with your doctor on decreasing if you are um, trying to get off of it. It needs to be weaned to a lower dosage. All right, everybody still with me? <laughs> Just put this in here. Do you guys ever feel like this? This pill is for your heart. That one is for your eyes. That one's for blood pressure. That's for diabetes. That's a blood thinner. That's for cholesterol. That's for dizziness. He's like, what's for dessert? It's true. Sometimes we get a lot of medications and we just feel like it's a whole meal in itself. Unfortunately, the medications are helping us and we do need them. Now, hopefully we're doing everything we can to manage our risk as far as exercise and diet to so limit our needs of medication. And that's very important too. Your lifestyle, living a heart-healthy lifestyle, is going to make a huge difference on how much medication you're on. Cholesterol-lowering medications, perfect example, right? Diet. So if you're eating high-fat, high-cholesterol foods, you're going to need more cholesterol medication. So if you're eating a healthy diet, you might not need as much medication to lower your cholesterol. Not always. Some people just have that you know, gene in their body. It makes them make that cholesterol more than others. Um, that's just a genetic aspect. But just be aware, um, the cornerstone of treating high cholesterol is a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. Now, keeping that in mind, sometimes we do need the assistance of medications. That is where statins come in into play. So we have many different types of statins and what these medications do are lower your low density lipoprotein, the bad cholesterol, and lower triglycerides in the blood, which are also a bad cholesterol. Okay? So by lowering that, we're not having the excess cholesterol deposited into our arteries if we can keep that low enough. That is our goal. Now, the problem is statins do have quite a few side effects. A lot of people will experience muscle pain, weakness, or cramps in their legs especially. And they give up on the medication, which is not what you should do. You should talk to your doctor about it because one statin might affect you that way, but another might not bother you. So you need to try every statin before you give up because they're the only ones that prove to be effective in lowering cholesterol. They should always be tried, um, as it says here, the only drug that has been directly associated with reduced risk for heart attack and stroke are statins.
You want to take your statins with your evening meal at bedtime. Okay, you want it later in the day because your body releases cholesterol at night. So that's the best time to put your medication to work. If you want it to be most effective, take it at night before bedtime or with your evening meal. But you also need to be cautious of um, eating grapefruit and pomegranate because they can interact with that. It can actually intensify the statin. If you're eating grapefruit or pomegranate, so be very cautious of that, please. A Torben statin is the most common one that we see, but there are others out there. You might recognize some of those on the left side of your screen. And you see the good cholesterol in the little picture, the HDL guy, high density lipoprotein is brushing and cleaning out the bad cholesterol. It's cleaning our arteries. The good guy. Get rid of that bad LDL. All right, antiarrhythmics. Antiarrhythmics slow the electrical conduction in the heart. And that's just to help maintain a normal heart rate and rhythm, okay? So they're used to treat arrhythmias, which is an irregular heartbeat. If somebody is in a fib, they'll be, um, they might use antiarrhythmics medications to help get them back into a normal sinus rhythm. They are, um, they do need to be started in a hospital, okay? You need to be on a monitor because you could get a very fast or a very slow heart rate, you could have difficulty breathing, you could have vision changes, numbness, weight change, and you could have heart rhythm changes. So you need to be on a cardiac monitor in the hospital when these medications are started, all right? They are very um, serious medications that need to be monitored. You also wanna take them with food because they often cause uh, GI upset, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, these are all very common symptoms of any antiarrhythmic, so be cautious of that. They can also cause a bitter metallic taste to your mouth, not always, but sometimes, and they'll make you sensitive to sunlight, so you have to be cautious of that. Make sure you got your sunscreen on or your sun hat on if you're outside, and you're going to need ongoing monitoring. Okay, a lot of these antiarrhythmics are just used uh, short term, but occasionally there are some patients that are on them long term. If you are on them long term, they need to monitor you for toxicity. All right, they're going to want to do blood work, they're going to do chest x ray, they're going to want to check and compare to how you were the previous test, and just to make sure that you are doing okay on these medications and that it's not reaching toxic levels. Diuretics, a water pill. This is our favorite, right? Gets everybody running to the bathroom. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, they're making you go to the bathroom often because it's helping your kidneys get rid of excess fluid and salt from your body. Now, by doing that, it helps reduce swelling it helps reduce blood pressure and reduce the workload of the heart, all right? When your heart, think of it as a pump, and when it's not pumping efficiently, especially with congestive heart failure, you're gonna build up extra fluid. And it's gonna continue building more and more until it gets to your lungs where you're so short of breath you can't breathe and you end up in the ER. This is why you're on a diuretic. This is preventing that fluid buildup. It's getting that excess fluid off, and it is so important to take your medication. Many, many times people do not take their diuretic because they're going somewhere, or they're worried about having to find a bathroom. Please do not do that. Please make sure, you know, if you need to know where their bathrooms are before you leave, just, you have, these medications are so important, you don't want to skip your dose, okay? Lots of different ones out there, they work in different ways. Um, they will cause weight loss from the fluid that it gets off of your body. Fluid weighs a lot. 
Um, it can cause lightheadedness, low blood pressure, dehydration. If you're on too high of a dose, you know, you might start having getting dehydrated and get blood pressure getting really low. So be cautious of that. Um, certain ones will actually cause potassium depletion, and so you'll have to take a supplement, a potassium supplement with it, but not all diuretics do that. Use cautiously if you have severe renal disease or liver disease, okay, because this can worsen that. You want to make sure um, that your doctor's aware. And if it's prescribed twice a day, I highly recommend that you take it early in the morning and in the afternoon. If you take it at nighttime, right before you go to bed, you're going to be up all night going to the bathroom, and you don't want that. So try to take your last dose, the second dose of the day, in the afternoon so that you can get that out of your system before you go to bed. Nitrates. These medications cause your blood vessels to relax and open up. And that's going to increase your blood flow, and it's going to increase oxygen to the heart muscle. They're known as vasodilators. They work quickly. Most common, nitroglycerin, okay. Um, it's used to treat angina, chest pain, and to help reduce the workload of the heart. So we take Nitroglycerin is in a tiny little tablet that you put under your tongue if you're having chest pain. The reason it's put under your tongue is it actually dissolves into your system much faster through your um, glands in your mouth instead of swallowing it. So we're getting it into our bloodstream faster and getting up, opening up those blood vessels that are causing the angina, okay? So if you've got a blockage and your heart is experiencing a lack of oxygen and blood, it's sending out pain signals, you take a nitroglycerin, hopefully that will resolve that by opening up that blood vessel so that blood can get through there until you can get medical treatment. You can take this every five minutes up to three doses. But just be cautious that it will drop your blood pressure quite a bit, okay? So if you already have low blood pressure, watch out. It's going to cause headaches, but you got to, you know, weigh the benefits here. You've got a headache versus heart damage. I think I'd take the headache on. Um, if chest pain is not resolved after taking the nitroglycerin, definitely call 911. Don't wait around. Always carry your nitroglycerin tablets with you if you have them ordered, okay? Don't just say, oh, they're in my house, because when you're outside having chest pain and it's so severe you can't make it to your house to get your nitroglycerin, they're not going to do you any good. You always want to carry them with you, okay? So please, there's lots of containers out there, even necklaces that you can get that you can put them in. Just put it in your pocket, in your purse. Keep them with you at all times. Also, a lot of times people forget because they don't ever have to use the nitroglycerin, and that nitroglycerin actually expires. So you want to check the expiration date, right? They're only good for so long. You want to make sure you check the expiration date that they're still good. If they are expired, then you need to get a new bottle to carry with you, even if you're not using them you want to get a new bottle to carry with you because it has been ordered by your doctor. Now, there is um, different types of nitroglycerin that they can use. A lot of times in the hospital, you'll see a paste used or, you know, patches and things. Um, there is also a nitroglycerin called um, asorbride or Indoor, and that is used for people that have stable angina, they call it, where, you know, they are getting a very slow dose of nitroglycerin throughout the day to help keep those vessels open. And that's it. If you have any questions, please come and see me at Cardiac Recap. Thank you.